Let's begin. Okay, folks, I think we're going to get started. Um, welcome, first of all. Um, this is the first um, event that we've done of this kind. Um, I'll start by introducing myself and, and the organization I'm with. My name is Emily Hopkins. I'm the projects coordinator for the Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism. We're a new organization we launched just last month um, that is aimed at um, a kind of filling the gap of uh, money and resources for local journalism in uh, Boston and its environs. Uh, we try to connect with writers who may not have a newsroom or newsrooms that may not have enough sort of resources uh, to produce the kind of journalism that they want to do. And uh, so we're hoping to set up that kind of ecosystem in Boston so that we can do things like we did um, for uh, uh, the piece that we're here to discuss tonight. So um, we are here to talk about um, Barry's Corner. Um, this piece, uh, 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 sorry, um, this piece we, was written by uh, Rachel Hawk, who's right here. She is our um, journalist uh, right now um, for this piece. But uh, she came to binge with this story as a news tip, and actually uh, we asked her to write it, so she, this is kind of her first foray in journalism, right? Yeah. And um, we're really pleased with the results, uh, that we have a really well-researched piece um, and with great reporting and a great overview of what's going on in Lower Alston. Um, if you haven't read the piece, uh, we're, it talks a lot about um, the plans uh, the Boston Region Development Authority had um, during the 60s, uh, everyone knows about urban renewal um, in the West End, uh, but uh, it turns out that there was a lot of stuff going on in Barry's Corner, which is right down the road, um, and actually was where um, the Charles View Apartments used to be located until 2013, when they were moved here so that Harvard could proceed with some development. Um, uh, Harvard also has a hand in the development of the area. Um, we, uh, as the article mentions, they own more land in Alston than in Cambridge at this point, um, which uh, is kind of uh, surprising considering they have a reputation for being part of the Cambridge community. Um, so that's why we're, why we're here today. Um, what our panelists are um, Rachel, she is the Artistic Associate of Liars and Believers Theatre Company. Um, she uh, did, re did the piece for us um, in The Dig, and you can find that um, in newsstands news right now um, until tomorrow, or you can find it online at digboston.com. Um, also joining us is Joyce Radner. She's been a um, resident of uh, North Alston or Lower Alston, depending on <laughs> who you ask. Um, it's, a, it's called a different thing. Um, for over two decades, and she's also an active member of the um, Harvard Alston Task Force. Uh, Alston Harvard Task Force. You, no, no. Subcommittee. Sorry, subcommittee. Subcommittee, okay, sorry. Let me look at my notes and actually get this right. Uh, of the Construction Mitigation Subcommittee of the Alston Harvard Task Force. Exactly. And we also have author and historian and community activist Jim Brable here, who is the author of A People's History of the New Boston, um, which I pulled out today uh, to kind of get ready for this talk, and I found out, uh, realized that um, there's actually a picture of some uh, the North Harvard um, activists, the community of Barry's Corner, that were fighting with uh, fought urban renewal during the 60s. Um, so uh, very prevalent, goes into it in the book, into a lot of other um, ways that the um, community or that Boston was shaped um, by uh, a not just the powers of D, but also by a lot of people who fought for their communities and um, who don't necessarily get the recognition that they deserve. Um, so to start, um, I'll uh, ask you guys a few questions, and then um, we'll probably move on a little bit later to um, questions that you guys have, um, and then we'll wrap up, and you guys uh, can take a look um, at the piece over there. And before I actually start the talk, uh, I just want to mention that uh, Binge produces a tech quarterly, um, and uh, you can check that out. It's really nice, so make sure you just take a look before you leave. But, okay, so now for 
the panel. Um, I think that it's only appropriate, since this is a question that we've been asking how to the promotion of the piece up until now, um, Rachel, who is um, Annie Sor Soricelli or Soricelli? I think it's Soricelli. Soricelli. Who is Annie Soricelli? Annie Soricelli um, is a uh, Can you use the microphone? Yes, yep. I can. Thank you. Is this better? It's, is this enough? There you go. Now it's on. Is it on? Testing. Uh, Testing. Can you hear me? Okay. Annie Sorcelli was a resident of North Harvard Street. Um, she was born in Italy, lived uh, on North Harvard Street with her uh, husband until he got sick and passed away, and her three daughters. Um, she was an activist when they, uh, the BRA uh, let the residents know that they were going to be tearing down all of their homes uh, to build luxury apartments. Annie was among the women uh, and men who, uh, who protested. Um, the reason I asked the question who she was is because her name was at the bottom of a, pro of a, a protest sign that said, To Hell with Urban Renewal. Um, and at the bottom it said, In Memoriam, Annie Soricelli and others who died defending their homes. So my question was, well, who was she? Um, I did not find out how she passed away, uh, but she was, you know, in her late 70s. Um, and that's, that's, uh, she was. She was an activist and a, a resident. Um, so, take, can you take us a, a little bit more into kind of the process of um, how uh, what how you found out about things, kind of how you dug through the information? Mm -hmm. Well, I started um, with books. Uh, Jim's book was very helpful. Um, as was a book by uh, William Marchione on the history of the city. Um, and that gave me kind of the overview of, of what happened in, in their own words. And uh, then I went to the library, and I, the BRA has an archive of press clippings uh, from that era. And um, that's kind of really where the story, well, uh, <laughs> uh, that the story really then came out, and Annie really came out, as she was very outspoken and is quoted in many of the articles, um, which was really a gift because uh, we got some of her in her own words. Um, there isn't a whole lot written about the protests in the Boston Globe, uh, which is the only newspaper that existed back then that still exists. Um, so really I had to go and look at the newspaper clippings in the library to, to get that knowledge. Um, and you also looked at some of the maps, and those were interesting. Yes, those were. There were also um, in the BRE archives. There were the planning maps um, that showed exactly what they were planning. There was also a copy of the blue ribbon panel that Mayor Collins instituted. Um, there were copies of the letters that were sent to the resident. I found the ones that were sent to Annie Soricelli, with her name misspelled, um, demanding that she buy back her house that. Uh, that they had taken by eminent domain. Um, and yeah, libraries are awesome. <laughs> I think uh, I, I took a look at these maps uh, during the production of the story, and one, one of the things that I um, noted with um, like kind of sad, the sad irony is that on the, those maps, the entirety of this neighborhood is um, designated uh, is it blighted? Blighted, yeah. So they, when you have a map with almost no uh, like blighted areas, and then an entire neighborhood is as a as such, it's kind of remarkable. Um, so Jim, I'm wondering, you know, um, more broadly about how the story of Barry's Corner maybe um, fits into urban renewal uh, in Boston and its kind of um, where does it is it positioned in that history? Um, unfortunately, it's, it's often forgotten. Uh, the West End does get uh, most of the notoriety, uh, and deservingly so, because they put up a fuss before anybody else did. Uh, the first neighborhood that was lost to urban renewal was the New York streets area of the South End. Uh, then the West End, and the West End learned from the New York streets, and people there did raise a ruckus. Uh, they weren't successful. Uh, what I say today is that the reason other neighborhoods were able to be spared from urban renewal was because the West End did raise such a ruckus and was lost, 
and neighborhoods said that that wasn't going to happen to them. Um, North Harvard Street was called a West End in miniature by a group of planners at MIT and Harvard who wrote a letter to Mayor Collins protesting the urban renewal plan here. Um, obviously, the letter didn't do much good because the the neighborhood wasn't the the neighborhood was lost. Um, and uh, just for a little bit of background, um, the North Harvard Street Urban Renewal Plan was different than others. In 1960, the city came out with uh, uh, plans for 10 or 15 neighborhoods. Uh, North, Alston, uh, North Harvard Street was not among them. Uh, it was only declared an urban renewal area because uh, a trio of developers found a spot at North Harvard Street where they wanted to put up a 10 to 12 story what they call luxury apartment building. Uh, and because it was so hard to get anybody to build anything in Boston back then, the city, um, and by then the BRA, the BRA was only created in 1957, but the city jumped on it and said, great, uh, we're having trouble getting anybody to build anything. Whatever you want to build, you're interested in North Harvard Street, fine. And it was declared an urban renewal area. Um, as you, you mentioned, the, the phrase blighted, uh, which is a, a technical term that had to be used in order to qualify for urban renewal. And in the, um, the hearing that was held at the Thomas Gardner School, uh, there's a quote from, uh, there's, so much, there's so much to say here, I'm, <laughs> I'm having trouble sorting it all out. But, uh, <coughs> Monsignor Timothy Gleason, I uh, see uh, Mr. Lally, I believe, uh, nodding uh, his head. Uh, Monsignor Gleason was approached by residents early on who asked if they could use St. Mary's Church um, to hold meetings, and he turned them down. And his reasoning was uh, Cardinal Cushing would think you're too political. But to show you how things changed, Within a, a year or two, as people understood this urban renewal business, they saw that there was a reason to be political. So within a couple of years, Monsignor Gleason was testifying against urban <coughs> renewal at the Thomas Gardner School, and he said, um, these people are good, God-loving people. The word blighted means rot and decay. There is nothing rotten, nothing decayed in Barry's Corner. I know these people. I've lived with them, climbed their stairs, and talked with everyone personally. The Ryans, the McKinneys, Frank Williams and his wife, I appeal to your sense of justice and fairness. Don't put these people out. So that, that just goes to show how quickly and how effectively the people in Barry's Corner, Annie Suricelli, Marjorie Redgate, who was uh, pretty much the leader of the group, and all the other neighborhoods really, all the other neighbors uh, really organized and became activists and uh, tried to, to swing public opinion <coughs> against the urban renewal plan. Um, and Joyce, I've heard you, you talked a little bit about some, I know you didn't live here um, during that time. Uh, as you said, you were, I think you were nine, nine years old in, in Utica, right? In Utica, New York. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, so, but you have heard from your neighbors um, still, and this still plagues them. Um, can you talk maybe a little bit about what, what kind of scars still exist in the community from, from this, um, this uh, abomination of uh, community planning? Well, it actually came quite as a surprise to me, because even though I'd heard stories of this, I didn't realize that, and Mr. Lally probably can speak to this better than I, but how current those wounds still are for some people whose houses were torn down and had to leave the neighborhood, or leave their homes and move to a different um, part of the neighborhood. And it really came into my consciousness more viscerally when Harvard and Samuels began um, building their new apartment complex in Barry's Corner. And it was as though the scab had just been picked off a fairly recent wound, even though the wound was 50 plus years old. So it, it does show how, how upsetting it can be to a community to be that uh, betrayed. 
by its own city. And um, Rachel, maybe you can talk a little bit, Rachel and Jim, and all of you I think really can talk uh, to this, and, and where, where does Harvard come into this story um, then, and, and, and maybe throughout the, the time it's moved more and more into the area? Well, I don't know if, if Jim has more information on this, but the sense that I got was always that Harvard wanted in from the beginning. Um, I didn't find evidence of that. Um, in some of the articles I read, they, the BRA said, you know, yes, this was different from our other urban renewal projects because they were trying to stop Harvard from building a soccer field in that area. They said, if we don't seize this land by eminent domain, Harvard will build a soccer field. And of course, Harvard denied that. Um, but to me, it just makes so much sense. When I interviewed you, Joyce, you said Harvard plans out 200 years. And I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that they looked at the BRA taking that land and said, we should take that land someday. Um, and now they have. So um, well, again, that's nothing I found actual evidence of. Um, circumstantially, that's, that's what makes sense to me. Um, I don't know, can either of you speak? Um, one of the, um, I should point out that uh, I brought a copy of my book, a couple of copies of my book, but the best book written on the subject was written by Marjorie Redgate, never published, over 400 pages. Uh, she wrote a, a kind of first person description of everything that, what, that went on for, ironically, a, a course at the Harvard Extension School. <laughs> <laughs> and it is great. Every neighborhood should have this. It's blow by blow, blow, chapter by chapter. It really tells the story. Uh, and one of the things she talks about in, the, in her manuscript is how when they got wind of the urban renewal plan, they went to Harvard to ask Harvard to uh, take better care of its property. Sound familiar out there? Um, this was 1962. Uh, and they thought if Harvard took better care of its property, maybe the city wouldn't declare the area blighted and would spare it from urban renewal. Harvard responded by evicting tenants from its buildings, boarding the buildings up, shutting electricity off, and shutting the water off to the buildings because they wanted the urban renewal to continue. And they wanted to uh, be able to capitalize on uh, the property they owned and possibly uh, buy up more property, so uh, things don't change very much over the years in that regard. Joyce, you, and you found out after you bought your house that the land surrounding it was owned by Harvard, right? Yeah, just months after I bought my house, 22 years ago, the story broke that Harvard threw a I don't know what the proper word is, but in the vernacular, sort of a shell company was buying up um, all the property in Alston. And that now I owned a piece of property that was at some point going to be on Harvard's campus, as opposed to, you know, being a neighbor of the business school, I was, you know, within feet of property they owned. So, uh, and so, and instead of not only just being a neighbor to the business school, but surrounded by a community of, of just folks, you might be surrounded by students. Could, could. I am now surrounded by the best group of individuals I could ever wish to have, and I hope to have them for a very, very long time. But, but yes, I mean, ultimately, um, happily, I don't believe Harvard, unless my neighbors are holding out on me, I don't think Harvard owns any of our homes um, yet. But, um, but certainly any open land or any commercial business that they feel they can approach, they do. And they pay them handily for it. I don't blame business owners who, who maybe are a few years away from retirement and are being an offer they can't refuse. And I would probably take it too. But, but so far the, the, the strictly residential areas seem to have stayed safe. But everything else is hard. I'd just like to add one thing. Um, we start, um, most of these discussions start with urban renewal, which is a, a dirty word, and um, with a lot of good reasons for that. 
But urban renewal was an attempt by the government to rebuild cities which were in tough shape at the time. Um, uh, I have uh, uh, a guy named Val Hyman from the South End talks about uh, his first impressions of the Boston Redevelopment Authority. He said, you know, at first we thought the BRA was out to destroy our neighborhoods. We didn't realize that wasn't the problem. The problem was they didn't know what the hell they were doing. Uh, so the government was trying to do the right thing, but they, it was early. They didn't know what the right thing was. They were very unsophisticated. They were trying all kinds of things, and a lot of them didn't work. Uh, I think the lesson could be that if you, if you don't know what you're doing, go slow and listen to people rather than go quickly and don't listen to people. Uh, but in terms of uh, talking about Harvard both then and now, now government really isn't um, the issue these days. In Boston especially, it's institutional expansion and private development. And so the, the discussion, instead of just being the, the people against the urban renewal in the government, it's, it's now uh, the people looking to government to kind of referee and protect them from the excesses of institutional expansion and uh, the private economy. And I think with Charles View too is an example of how people were able to leverage government against that institutional expansion. Uh, I don't know what everybody thinks about the land swap and how this turned out. It, it seems pretty spectacular to me as an outsider. But it is a case where everyone's gotten much more sophisticated. Uh, everything is, a, is quite a bit more transparent, it's still not completely transparent. But it seems like the community and the neighbors were able to kind of leverage their position into gaining something uh, pretty good from this, uh, this swap in a kind of a triangle agreement between the city and Harvard and the community. Yeah, and to your point, Jim, we're right now, <clears throat> the, the neighborhood is right now in a struggle with the BRA, we think, or the mayor. Um, to try and understand how this neighborhood continues to be representative, represented by a group of community members um, who are bargaining with Harvard and brokering the task force. The task force. And, and it, it seems to be very unclear who appoints task force members. Um, at this point, we don't know who even sits on the task force because the BRA has told us people have resigned, but they won't say who. So we sort of count noses at the meetings to try and figure out who's showing up. So we really don't know who's, who's working with Harvard and the BRA, allegedly on behalf of the, the neighborhood. So that remains this, the triangle that I couldn't agree more. I think this is one of the, the gems in this community, this new, Charles View complex, um, but I think going forward, its new developments are proposed almost exclusively by Harvard or one of its partners. The, figuring out that that triad um, is going to be very important for the community going forward. Yeah, I mean, one thing that Chip, who I think I saw come in, said to me uh, when I was interviewing for him for the article is that really any infusion of money into this neighborhood right now comes from Harvard. We're not really getting very much from the city. Um, and so Harvard resources could be really, really great for the community. Uh, there's a lot of good they could do that we're not getting from the city. Uh, one of my pipe dreams is that they'll pay to have that Anderson Bridge fixed, like, now. Um, There's a meeting tomorrow night. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's almost like if the city relies on Harvard to take care of this area, then they don't have to. And that leaves us uh, with really no uh, no recourse. We don't have any way to, to fight back or to say, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? To a full yeah, I mean, we don't have any bargaining chips because it's Harvard who's going to do the development here, and that could be really good um, if it's not really bad. What do you, what, yeah, what, what do you guys, what do you guys feel about the, the term public-private partnership? I don't know that I have feelings about that term. 
Uh, I always say, uh, count your money when, when you hear it, but um, it is the new reality. Um, you talk about the city isn't doing that much here. The cities don't have the money that they used to. Uh, they used to get it from the federal government. The federal government doesn't have the money it used to. And that's why you're left with the private, uh, private uh, sector and the nonprofit sector. But the city is the place you go to to work on your behalf. So that's where the organizing has to be. That's the pressure point. Uh, Harvard can't do anything it wants to do. The city has to allow it. And, that, and you are the city. You are the citizens. You are the people that elect the people who run the government. And so that is where it all has to be fought out. One of the things that is more difficult today, in the old days, you just have a demonstration, have 500 people turn out and have a sit-in and yell and scream, and you either win or you lose. Now it's so complicated with all the technical stuff and all these consultants and the meetings drag on and on, and you get into floor area ratio and all inclusionary zoning. It is very difficult, but you do have people, I think as a community builders that operates this building, there are people like community builders, there are uh, organizations that are there to kind of help residents understand all this. But you have to realize, you can't get, you have to have someone explain it to you, you have to force the city or the, the people that come into the neighborhood explain it to you, and then you have to organize over the big picture questions uh, and not get bogged down into the details. Is it fair or is it not fair? Are we getting something? Are we not getting something? Uh, let a kind of subset of the community get involved in the nitty gritty, but uh, have enough uh, confidence in them and connection to them that they explain whether something's a good deal or not. And the rest of it is just old fashioned community organizing. Joyce, I'm curious because, uh, so for people who maybe don't understand um, the work you do in the, in the community uh, on the construction mitigation subcommittee, um, can you explain like how that relates to the Alston Harvard Task Force um, and what you guys focus on? Yes, so uh, about eight years ago, um, when Harvard began its initial work on its science complex, which is at the corner of Western and Hague, right across from the business school. Um, the the Harvard Alston Task Force um, sort of spawned the uh, construction mitigation subcommittee because it didn't want to spend its two hours every two weeks talking about you know noise or trucks or you know dust. Um, so, at that time, the, the subcommittee became very active in just monitoring that construction activity, which went really, really well. I mean, it, it was a very well-oiled machine, Harvard's designee to our committee, um, who's a consultant for Harvard, um, is very forthcoming and cooperative. Um, and then things sort of died down when Harvard put a shutter around its five-acre, 50-foot deep hole mm -hmm. and, um, and closed up shop for a while in Alston. <coughs> uh, and then as it, as it started ramping back up and the Samuels project began up at Barry's Corner, the subcommittee restarted its efforts. And so we meet every two weeks and we just go over what are the project updates, where are roads going to be torn up like they are right now, um, how was Friday afternoon with the regatta coming into town and all of Barry's Corner ripped up and down to like one lane? It was a nightmare. Um, but um, so anyway, we, that's the kind of thing we look at. And, and things like noise. The Barry's Corner project um, raised a lot of issues because a lot of homeowners right in the, in the like Franklin Street, upper north of uh, Harvard Street area, were actually having damage to their homes from the vibration mm -hmm. of the of them putting in the whatever they were putting into the ground. So um, so we mitigated that and got the city councilor's office involved in making sure that those homeowners were made at least whole financially. Mm -hmm. um, 
So those are the kinds of things we continue to work on. And the Samuels project, that's the continuum, is that correct? Yes, yeah. continuum, yeah. yes. Um, and then the five-year rule, they, they, for the science complex, they started that, and then the recession hit, and that they, they had to take a break from construction. They paused. paused. How long did they, how they, long was that there? They paused seven years. Seven years. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, seven years, I yeah. believe is right. And um, so, but they have now just presented uh, plans mm -hmm. for the new, it'll, it's the engineering, the science and engineering building. So it won't be the stem cell research center that we were promised. It'll, this is more robotics and like drug um, development. And undergrads. And, and it will be a thousand undergrads a day. And uh, which is a far cry from the original plan. But, um, but you yeah, know, their, their plan seems to be, I mean, the building is certainly lovely. <coughs> And, 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 and uh, no, and I will say, at least my personal feeling is the plan they've presented is friendly to the residential neighborhood. They step the building down the closer it gets to homes. There'll be a big park area in the back. So for now, I mean, that's a temporary park, but I'm sure I'll be dead by the time they build anything else. So, um, so it, it, it is, they have brought the community into mind in their design of that. I think that leads on kind of really nicely into the next kind of subject where I want to talk about. And um, I know Jimmy has some ideas about um, you know things that private institutions like Harvard do or can do um, or should do. And um, you know those are all different. What they actually do, what they can do, and what they should do. So I'm curious what your thoughts on how um, both you and Joyce and uh, Jim, what your thoughts on what Harvard should be doing. Uh, well, I want to start. Uh, <coughs> Uh, well, I'd be, I'm, I'm an old 60s guy, both from the 60s and in the 60s. Um, but I want, you mentioned Harvard undergraduates and everybody kind of cringed. But back then, uh, the people uh, in North Harvard Street actually got allies, hundreds of Harvard students, a lot of the members of the Students for Democratic Society, uh, came and demonstrated when the moving trucks came to uh, threatening to evict people. Uh, and they demonstrated along with the residents. Uh, I'm not sure if that's happening these days. Uh, one of the people was Ira Jackson, who was a Harvard student, went on to be Kevin White's uh, chief of staff. Um, it would be nice if you could get students interested in helping you out. That, uh, that also happened in Mission Hill, where I, where I lived. Um, uh, Harvard students helped organize residents in Mission Hill, and uh, we were all we were able to create something called the Roxbury Tenants of Harvard that built Mission Park. That is uh, really a, kind of a success story, kind of like this. Um, uh, an architect who worked for Urban Planning Aid, John Sharrett, talked about using Harvard Harvard's power as leverage, as a way of shaming it. Uh, making it feel guilty, wanting to show off, uh, model public-private partnership, showing that it could do well and do good. All those things are, are still around and still available. It's kind of positioning that um, you need to do, uh, the residents <coughs> you need to do, to have, have how, uh, Harvard help you get the neighborhood you want. Um, and I just, I wanted to make sure uh, I got a quote in here from Marjorie Redgate, um, because it really kind of says it all. Uh, she talks about uh, what was threatened in Barry's Corner was one of our country's most rare and precious possessions, the neighborhood. A living, viable, sociological entity that binds people together and brings a good deal of joy and comfort to us all. And then she says, it couldn't happen here, you say. Well, it did and will happen again unless responsible citizens awake from apathetic sleep and remove from office the politicians responsible for this mess. <laughs> Marjorie Redgate, uh, you know, wrote this 57 years ago. Yeah, uh, you had mentioned when I interviewed you for the article that you think Harvard should uh, make a Redgate scholarship, uh, which I think is a fantastic idea. Um, that would be really great. 
Well, my suggestion when, when Rachel uh, asked me over the, over the phone, I guess it was, what should Harvard do? I mean, there's a million things that you can try and get Harvard to do, and I would recommend all of them. But one of them would be uh, a Redgate scholarship uh, to a local uh, young person from the neighborhood to hopefully go and study politics or urban planning at Harvard uh, and maybe learn how uh, to make sure that, that institutions can grow but so can, that neighborhoods can thrive. Uh, I think that would be a very worthy, worthy endeavor. Great idea. What are your thoughts? Well, it, it, and it, it's really to Jim's point and to Rachel's as well, is that I think the thing that Harvard can do, should do, needs to do, um, and perhaps the neighborhood needs to as well, is just spin the focus or spin the perspective on its axis so that they really become our neighbors, that they don't become an institution taking over a neighborhood, but they become neighbors like the person who, the new family who moves in next door. And we're really good about indoctrinating our new neighbors who move in. You know, we, we sort of tell them the rules. You never, never take a taxi to the airport. We will drive you in. You know, don't hire a dog sitter. We'll, you know, the neighbors will take care. Um, and that's sort of the, that really is the, the ethos of the neighborhood. And, um, and Harvard, if Harvard could just become a neighbor instead of an invader, it, it would change the entire dynamic. Now I think likewise, the neighborhood could do better at inviting them in as a new neighbor, as opposed to constantly putting up stop signs and saying, if you, if you um, proposed it, we must hate it. Because they have done some very nice things. You know, they've done some pretty lame things for the neighborhood, like giving us, you know, tickets to football games that we don't want to go see. But, um, but they also have built the Ed Portal, which I'm not a parent, but for parents in this neighborhood has been a wonderful benefit. So, that, you know, but again, if they could be more neighborly and we could accept them better as neighbors, um, I think that just that mind shift would make a huge difference in what Ms. Redgate was, was talking about. Rachel, what do you think? I just really want that bridge built. <laughs> <laughs> if, they, uh, if they put money into that bridge, I would forgive them many sins. Not all, but many. <laughs> um, and uh, something I think um, both was really interesting, uh, kind of from a then and now perspective, is um, right, right before uh, we started, we were talking about um, the building that uh, uh, Harvard owns on Lincoln Street. Now, if you've ever passed uh, that big glass building and wonder what it, it is, it's, uh, it's a, it was supposed to be a telecommunication center. And then the dot-com bubble burst, and then it was supposed to be uh, the tech company, this tech startup that went out of business, sold it to Harvard, and then it was supposed to be, um, you know, biotech or something like that. But it's never been occupied, um, and it's, it's not pretty to look at. Um, so when we talk about, you know, Harvard kind of letting their houses go to ruin um, because eventually they want to maybe build on that land, um, you know, that's. Just leave it there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would love to see Harvard put a performance space um, in some of its building around here that's been mentioned in some of their plans, but as far as I can tell, they've never done anything serious about that. And Boston is having a real crisis in the arts communities in terms of venues and rehearsal spaces and performance space in rock and roll and classical music and theater everywhere. There's not enough space, and um, I think that would be a really good use. I'll turn it over to you guys if, um, if you have, guys have questions and want to maybe line up on um, the line or if you just want to speak for your seat, that's fine too. Thank you, Speedy. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jane McHale and I live on Litchfield Street right here and um, have been part of the uh, advocacy for the neighborhood and the community with. Harvard and anything else that is built around here for um, 
probably eight years, I don't know, it seems like forever, in a way. But I was, besides, you know, I come from Jim's era, so I was marching like when I was a hippie, but hadn't do, done too much politically in between until this. And, um, you know, they say don't, you can't fight City Hall. Um, but I learned very differently that um, uh, civil disobedience, if you would, is um, uh, doesn't have to be signs and violence and screaming. Um, I think what I learned in the process of working with the Harvard Alston uh, task force and uh, the skating club. Uh, by the way, the building that you were talking about, I was on the impact advisory group for the skating club land trade yeah. that Harvard was going to get the skating or do the land trade with the skating club uh, of Boston. But that fell through because the skating club really didn't have the bandwidth to do what they had hoped to do. So Harvard pulled the agreement, which I can understand. You know, they just couldn't build it. Um, but the the um, it, the need for neighbors and for community to um, be part of discussions and to be kind of um, committed and persistent to be able to speak up and stand their ground um, and also listen. Um, you know, Joyce had talked about a, a two-way street. I find Harvard. Um, you know, Harvard has done amazing things for this community. Um, they are very embarrassable. So, um, and I find you, you can make a couple calls and you can get action if you're not berserk about it. I mean, if you really are respectful and they're respectful to you um, and you're persistent with your points and you listen, um, things can get done and things can, can, can get done with respect, um, and you can change City Hall. So I'm, I'm very um, heartened by what's happening in the community. You certainly can't get everything you want. Mm -hmm. um, but this this whole complex here, which was just, who's the executive director right here, um, this just got an amazing national award for an example of affordable housing and a partnership private and public partnership, um, but a small group of neighbors here actually had an outside <coughs> architect redesign this whole place, and it became this, all the townhomes. It was originally to, um, designed for six bar buildings built into the community like this. And a little old architect named Simon <coughs> Uh, saw it in the paper and called. Who, who was the architect of the original Charles View? Who was That's the architect right. of the original Charles View a million years ago? Saw it, <coughs> 80 something years old, called us, saw it in the globe, called us and said, You're not going to get anywhere as a little neighborhood group unless you have your own architect and I'll be it for free. Hmm. So he helped us, he did charrettes with neighbors and redesigned this complex to very similar to what you see. Um, so community activism is live and well, and it can work. Yeah, and, and, and it makes a better outcome in the long run. And I think that's also, I mean, I think one of the things that gets lost in, in the history on this is that various corner in that community fought like hell, they really did. There were a number of people that came together to work with them. The original committee for North, that became the committee for North Harvard, which is still an interdenominational nonprofit that is in partnership with the community builders here. They lost the war, but they preserved affordability with the building of the, the old Charles Hugh apartments. And it's important not to lose that aspect um, because there could have been a huge 12-story luxury apartment development there, and instead there was a, a development that um, has had numbers of families grow up there and do wonderful things in the city of Boston. So, Hundreds of families. 
240 here. To that point, when, uh, when I started, I've been working on this article for about six months, so when I started working on it, the Olympics were still going to be coming <laughs> to Boston, so yeah, you can fight City Hall. There's 10 people on Twitter. <laughs> I'm very glad you brought that up about the Committee for North Harvard, which I understand is a developer here too. Um, and uh, one of the amazing things that happened back then was all the fighting in, uh, that went on forced Mayor Collins, who did not back down very easily, to form a Blue Ribbon Commission to restudy the whole plan. And surprise, surprise, the Blue Ribbon Commission said, junk the first plan. It actually recommended that all the houses that were still standing be given back to the tenants, to the to the owners. Um, supposedly, the federal funding wouldn't allow that part of it, uh, and so. But um, the commission recommended putting the plan back out to bid and getting a new developer, and that's where Committee for North Harvard stepped in. And it, it, you're right; they 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 did lose the battle and ended up in a way winning the war. Uh, and, but that's what it takes. It's a long, long, long fight. Um, and you need that kind of continuity. You need the, the people the sitting in and, and protesting, but you also need the people that are willing to stay at meetings till midnight and go over the details. Uh, it's, all, it's all one big community and everybody's got a role to play in it. But if you work hard and stay at it long enough, you get something like this. Yeah, I think it's important to just like reiterate, like really drive home the fact that we wouldn't be in this building at all. This building would not exist if it weren't for the uh, the story that you guys are telling. The very uh, the community of Harvard, everyone who fought for their homes. And this community center would not exist if folks like um, this. Uh, Fiorentino, Josephine, um, hadn't fought for making sure that there was community space, not just for the residents in this development, but for the entire community. So there was a lot of work that went into that over the course of the 10 or 12 years that this development was being negotiated and in the works. So that's, that's what the neighborhoods can do. And <laughs> I'm curious about how we would get access to read her book. Uh, so I, I was wondering if there's somebody who would be willing to make a copy of it and keep it here <coughs> for, for all the residents or all the. Yeah. That would be that. Okay. Uh, I think that would be great. I, I'd like to get you know, this yeah. one back. I'll give it back to you. <laughs> <laughs> but oh no, I, I, that's why I brought it. Yeah. Um, I. I'll, like this, hearing the story of this building is, is really heartening for me to hear, but I'm also very worried about my current generation because you have entrenched history to back you up, and you have a history of people understanding neighborhoods without being addicted to their internet, without watching television all day, and without being so overworked that they don't have time to organize on a community level, and also, I don't know, because the thing that tortures me every day is like every splinter of land that I see has a luxury condo piling up on it. And my heart breaks every time about that and like affordable living spaces that are insulting. Um, I, I really want to change this situation and I'm extremely impressed that you managed to pull it off, but I just worry if the same thing can be replicated in a community where like, like me, like I, for a while living in Alston, I had that sense of neighborhood that you read from that book. Um, but I also <coughs> felt it be ripped away from me, like absolutely ripped away from me. And it's such a transient area. There's no home ownership. I feel like I get poorer every year and I can't hang on. But I want to hang on. I don't know. It's just, it's just how I feel about this. Um, um, like I guess how can I get into this building but then I don't want to take it away from somebody else who might need it more I just feel like there's no place for me anymore um, I, I'd like to respond both uh, humorously and non-humorously one is the, the reason people don't have 
uh, that much time to get involved in their neighborhoods is they're spending too much time right. on, the, on their phones and the internet. The other is that I can't tell you how many people I interviewed for this book who were activists back in the 60s and 70s and referred to the old mimeograph machines where you would run the stencil off and get purple ink all over your fingers. Everybody remembered that. But the, the uh, crude methods we had back then, we were able to turn out hundreds of people day after day, time after time for these protests and demonstrations. You've got these iPhones, you've got the internet, you've got email chains, yeah. use them. <laughs> use them for local things rather than national, international, and YouTube yeah. things. But I think also in a greater way, like, people almost seem like they're afraid of each other more. Like, I don't have an iPhone because I'm afraid of burning my whole life away on that. But, like, on, on the one hand, people are suspicious of the government without really asking more nuanced questions about it. You know, as, you, as people have been saying here, it's like, you don't, you have to kind of figure out how to get them to referee or you have to really get involved in City Hall. Whereas a lot of people are like, oh, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna touch that. I just wanna learn all about the Kardashians or something. Or, or like, I wish there were more people here right now, but there's not. It's not like flashy and sexy, like online. And I wish more modernity didn't mean getting away from each other, you know, or from mediating our whole lives through a phone. You know, you still have to house yourself, you still have to live with people, you still have to have a sense of community. And, and you have to uh, address your local representatives, yeah. including the one who just walked in, <laughs> Kevin Holland, who's here with you tonight. Hey, Kevin. And who, who, who is a star when it comes to promoting affordable housing in Boston and the rest of the state. Can I just say, say something? Um, it's really overwhelming, but if you pick one local issue, mm -hmm. one that you care about and that you want to take your little time to be able to kind of get to where the source of power and information comes from, um, you'll, you'll find something and you'll find a big, but much more behind it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's just too much to think about everything. You have yeah. to just pick one issue you care about yeah. and go for it. I want to respond too to, to exactly back up your things is um, I live in the neighborhood. My name is Galen. I, I work with Joanne doing bikes programs here. I also work with Harvard doing bikes programs at the Ed Portal, and we have a bike stand that we have on the street corner mm -hmm. that we flag down people as they bike past, so we get to engage with like random people like literally all races, ages, literally the people who are on the street. So um, to find the issue could be like, for instance, just as an example, biking opened up this avenue of doors to engage with people. And then that became like an advocacy point because biking in Boston now is like a contentious issue. Um, and then that led to like transportation issues, like putting bike lanes on the street or affordability and like um, healthcare, for instance. Like let's take, take two back diabetes away from 12 year olds and just from one issue you can kind of dive into it that way um, definitely need the Facebook to organize definitely need the social media to like blog about this and record it but you have to find multiple I guess avenues to find that one issue and um, like maybe your issue is the Anderson Bridge there's a meeting on Thursday where the state is finally going to present what they've been trying to hide for two years and so you know you could come and and be engaged, like that could be your issue. And then from that you find out, so the state's not talking to DCR. So now your issue is you have to figure out where DCR is at so that you can get more parkland. And then that leads you into the I-90 project because all these bridges are pieced together and they can't do one bridge without doing the other three bridges, but they have to wait until the turnpike comes down. And that's my example of like finding your issue and diving deeper. So personally for me it was biking. And that's when I used myself, we have a group called Common Wheels, which started in a garage in Rug Road, and they tore it down because they're gonna make parking lot for condos that they never built, but we got booted out of there, so we found a farmer's market, and then we found a ed portal, and then we found a community center. So, you know, you do bounce around, but finding different partners, and I think the key here, I'm sorry to ramble, but 
we talk about Harvard plus partnerships, and Harvard can find different partners. Maybe, maybe they find it with the city, maybe they find it with the state, maybe they find it with, you know, they bought up all the turnpike, for instance. There's partnerships going to happen there. They're going to build new neighborhoods on Harvard land if we push them to do it. So we have to find ways to find partnerships with all of these avenues for whatever your issue might be. Yeah, I mean, and one thing that happens though is you know, an issue, you pick your one issue, and it can take years. Decades. You know, decades. Yeah. And a problem for people of my generation is we don't know if we're going to be here in decades because I don't know if I'm going to be able to afford to be here in two years. Um, you know, there are luxury apartments going up two blocks away from me, and that doesn't make my rent go down. Um, it actually makes it the area more desirable. It makes it more expensive. I have to leave. I have to go somewhere else. And, um, you know, even if I still care about my issue, even if I wanted to continue the advocacy, it becomes harder because I'm not even there. I'm not a constituent. I have to haul across town to go to the meetings. Um, so this is really pr uh, a problem of, I mean, again, it's affordable housing, and it would be great if Harvard would build neighborhoods and if uh, people could come, and not just for home ownership, for renting, and I know we don't have rent control, but just some way of keeping people in the neighborhoods they want to be in, because I can't really, with my heart, invest in a neighborhood that I don't know if I'm gonna be able to stay here. The, the chairperson, uh, the director of the Boston Redevelopment Authority, his people grew up on my street, Royal Street. Mm -hmm. He's a local person. And uh, he went through Harvard, a uh, four-year scholarship. Uh, wasn't there, uh, Harvard did not uh, uh, donate the scholarship to the neighborhood because Brian was the president of his class <coughs> at the Boston Latin School. And that's kind of an automatic thing. thing. <coughs> One other kind of, kind of related, uh, but kind of distant too, Washington Austin. <laughs> is the person that, that Alston is named after. He was born in South Carolina in a, on a rice plantation. And, and I, I can't remember the, the precise name of the river that it's at, but it's a, a Makahatchee or Wakahatchee or something like that. It is right where all the flooding is taking place right now in that same area. So this, we have to look out for good old uh, Washington Austin, who did go to Harvard, by the way. And he's buried in right off Harvard School also. Right Say so what? It's right by Dawes Island. I'm sorry? It's the, it's the graveyard right across from Dawes Island where the 66 picks up. Uh, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know where the grave is, but... Yeah. but, but I saw it the other day. It's right by... Yeah, yeah, yeah it's right by Harvard School. And he was an artist. So... <laughs> Nick Ralston, I think it's nice. I can just just quickly. Um, oh, I was going to wrap up. So I was going to wrap up. <laughs> um, so if, if no one else uh, has any, um, oh yeah, Ethan. So the area where Barry's Corner is right now, there's a couple different names that they're trying to make that square be known as. Do you have anything to say about that? I saw they're trying to make it Alston Square. They're trying to change the name. Um, the only thing I know about that is that there is a petition. Um, I, I have no idea. I know it's at the at the dry cleaner on Western Avenue. Um, I don't know how many signatures there are, but I think Barry's Corner is probably here to stay. <laughs> I think that the petition had been to change it to Alston Square or mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, I heard a, a couple of opinions. Um, one thing that Chip had said that I think it's in the article is that Harvard doesn't want it to be called Alston Square, and they don't want it to be Harvard any, uh, Alston anything. Um, it actually has another name. It has one of those Memorial Square names. Um, and I don't remember what that name is, but I think that's a great alternative because I think Alston Square is not a, a great place-making <coughs> name. Um, but if it's not gonna be Barry's Corner, um, which I guess, I mean, you didn't know it as Barry's Corner when you moved in the 90s. Um, Never heard that term raised until <coughs> Harvard wanted to develop the land. Right. And I don't know if, you, if everyone heard, heard Joyce, but um, Barry's Corner wasn't something that you called the area until it showed up in the plans at Harvard. Well, some people say. may have. Some people, people, but yeah, I, I had never heard that right. phrase until Harvard called it Barry's Corner. And, there's and we all said, where's that? <laughs> and there's another Barry's Corner in Cambridge, so. Uh, 
which no one knows either. So. Yeah. Uh, but I, yeah, I mean, I think uh, that whatever the Memorial Square is, whose name I don't even know, is a is a contender in my book because it's already named that. Uh, Ms. Redgate referred to it different times in an article she's written for the local newspapers as, as Barry's car. And we have maps from uh, in the 19, uh, the 18, late 18th and the early 1900s that was, it's called uh, Barry's Corner. Uh, so, and, uh, so <laughs> and for a while, for a while some, uh, Harvard hired a, a city planner uh, who was going to, uh, you know, design whatever this has been done. And he, he said that, well, uh, we need a new place-making place and we should call that uh, Austin Square. Uh, there is an Austin Square, actually there's two of them, but there's an Austin Square now, right where the, where the Depot restaurant is. That's been Austin Square for, for all the old maps say Austin Square, as well as Barry's Corner. And when we brought it up to Harvard at meetings, they, uh, nothing much happened for about five or 10 years. And so the, they started referring to the area as uh, Barry's Corner, and then in parentheses, it said Austin Square. And then, and then for a couple of years, it was, uh, uh, the, the same mentioning the same thing, but then they finally dropped off uh, uh, the Austin Square idea. And the new complex, the, the, the apartment complex, is what something something at at Barry's. Yeah, Club. like so they continue on that at Barry's. Okay. So, um, yeah, just to wrap up, please uh, stay for a few minutes. Um, uh, we'll be cleaning up pretty quickly. But uh, uh, my colleague John actually ran out and got some copies of the uh, uh, issue of Dig Boston where this article appears. So um, take one on your way out, and uh, we'll make sure to do one for you. Um, and if you want to know more about the stuff that uh, Binge is doing, um, we, we've got uh, about 10 other projects uh, in the works. Um, some investigative, um, a lot of them hyper-local. Um, we've got a sign-up sheet where you can give us your email, and I have my business card right there, and just uh, snag one and reach out to me if you have questions, or you want to get involved, or you have a story that you want to work on, or you think that we should be working on, so. Um, and uh, yeah, check out uh, Jim's book. He brought a few copies uh, to sell. And also um, take a look again at our quarterly tech journal. It's going to be looking into, well, what we call um, innovation in the city and uh, kind of, uh, you know, covering it in a little bit of a different way. So take a look at that. Um, it's the way we fund Binge. It's the way, uh, one of the ways that we fund Binge and one of the ways that uh, we'll be able to uh, fund more projects like this. So um, take a look, maybe consider um, subscribing or even just sign up for our newsletter, it would be great. Thank you, thank you guys.